The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Surely you've heard some variation of that statement before. It expresses the tendency that many of us have to look at our current situation and imagine how much better our lives would be if only our circumstances would change. And so from our side of the proverbial fence, the situation around us looks bleak. The symbolic grass is brown and dry with weeds growing up and bare spots, other things going on. But just on the other side of the fence, with a changed job or location or marital status or car or whatever it may be, things look lush and green as if it was a professional golf course or something. However, once those circumstances change, we often find out that things are not as green as we thought they would be. Because on the other side of the fence, there's problems too. And maybe they're different problems, but problems nonetheless. So why do people think like this? Why do we torture ourselves constantly wishing that the particulars of our lives would be different? Why haven't we learned that circumstantial change does not solve all of our problems? Well, from a spiritual perspective, there's a number of different ways that we could approach this. For instance... Our lack of contentment reveals a failure to trust in the sovereignty of God. Also, covetousness is often at the root of our discontents. And we we want what someone else has, but the Lord's spoken clearly about this issue. The Tenth Commandment deals with coveting, and the Lord says, you shall not covet. Also, a failure to recognize that each life situation comes with its own set of problems demonstrates that we lack wisdom. If we really think that if just this one thing would change or just this set of circumstances would change that my problems would go away, if we really believe that, then it's demonstrating that we lack biblical wisdom. But for the Christian, there's another problem that's sometimes associated with a constant grass is greener mentality. And that is the erroneous thought that a change in circumstances would provide substantial spiritual benefits. For, for instance, the single Christian might think, well, if I only had a spouse, then it would be so much easier to serve God. We could pray together, we could study the Bible together, we could have deep spiritual conversations every day, and then I would be free from sexual temptation too. And my answer to that is, yeah, right, I don't think so. Or the married believer considers the single life and thinks, oh, if only I was single again, I could focus my life so much more on the Lord. Uh, I'd be able to read my Bible more, I'd be able to pray more, I'd be able to spend more time serving the Lord through His church, I'd be able to do this, I'd be able to do that, because I wouldn't have all the distractions that come with married life or, or, or family life. But the question then becomes, especially if you were already a Christian when you were single, did you do that when you were single before? Does that reflect what your life looked like before that? Before you had a spouse, were you doing those things? Or the Christian living in a, a small apartment says, well, if I could afford to live somewhere with more space, if I could just have a bigger place, then I could have people from church over all the time. We'd have all sorts of fantastic fellowship with one another. I could use my house for the Lord and Uh, in the benefit of my brothers and sisters in Christ, but is that realistic? Are you finding ways to fellowship with believers outside of your, your dwelling now? Meanwhile, the believer in the large house is sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I'm spending all of my time and resources maintaining this place. It's causing all sorts of issues. If only I had a smaller house, then I could devote more time and my finances to the Lord. Okay, but what did your schedule and what did your checkbook look like before you lived in the house that you're in now? And so we're constantly, we could go on and on and on. We rationalize that a change in our circumstances would provide substantial spiritual benefits. As if the only thing that's lacking in our Christian walk is that one thing. If that one thing changed, it'd be like the the, the magic key, the magic wand that suddenly we would take off in our spiritual life. It's the missing piece of the puzzle that we've been waiting for. But then along comes the Apostle Paul, who says things like, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk, that is live. 
And again, he says, each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. And again, brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. What? Why is Paul pressing this issue? Clearly, Paul does not understand that the grass is greener on the other side, right? I'm looking over the fence and I'm seeing it looks really green. It looks brown here. Does Paul not understand that? Well, actually, Paul knows exactly what he's talking about. And we'll explain more in just a moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, grant us contentment and help us to see uh, that we need to be faithful where we are. You call us to remain, that we would be faithful servants of yours in whatever situation, whatever life circumstances we find ourselves in, trusting in your sovereign hand to guide us Father, grant us these things, not for our own, just for our own benefit, but for your glory as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a, a series in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, the broken, beautiful, blood-bought body of Christ. And in chapter 7, we've been examining Paul's teaching on marriage. We've been talking about marriage. Paul's responding to a series of questions uh, and issues that were raised by the Corinthians in a letter to him. And as I've mentioned uh, throughout this time in chapter 7, the underlying theme of chapter 7 has been remaining as you are. Remaining in the condition that you're in. It's the theological foundation for everything we've been considering over the last several weeks. And so in our passage today in chapter 7, it's as if Paul hits the pause button and says, now I'm going to deal even more directly with the underlying foundation of what we've been doing all along. And so he decides to deal with that. He gets right to the heart of the matter in telling the Corinthians that they are to remain as they are. And the lessons from the passage today certainly apply to us today. And so as we did last week, we're going to begin by looking at a general principle, and then we're going to consider two examples that Paul provides in the text to kind of get us going down the, the road of application. So the first, print, or the, first, uh, the first part, we're going to look at this general principle, and that principle is this. Believers are called to remain in their current circumstances because circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. Believers are called to remain in their current circumstances because circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. Now, the first part of this principle that believers are called to remain in their current circumstances, that's clear as day in the text before us. I mentioned this before. So Paul says this quite openly in verses 17, verse 20, and verse 24. And so, in other words, we see it at the beginning of the passage, in the middle, and at the end. And I've said this a number of times before, that when a particular word or phrase or concept is repeated over and over and over again within a passage in the Bible, we need to pay attention, right? Think about this. You do this in your home. If you have children in your home, clean your room. And by the way, clean the room. Clean your room. Take the trash out. Take the trash out. Uh, don't forget to take the trash out. But when you repeat things over and over and over and over, you're trying to get a point across. And so when we see the same concept over and over and over, we should say, well, that must be important. It must be something that the Lord wants me to know, and certainly that the Apostle Paul wanted the Corinthian church to know. But actually, this idea is not just coming up in this text. It's been coming up all along in chapter 7, even before we've gotten to this text. And so Paul encouraged singles in the church to remain that way, unless they're being consumed with sexual temptation. And then he charged married believers to remain in their marital unions, both to believers and to unbelievers. And so, as we'll see today, he applies this principle of remaining to other life situations. And so, basically, this principle has been there, and here's an application, here's an application, in case you didn't get it, here's another one, and here's another one. And so, we're seeing this principle fleshed out. Now, this idea of remaining is not just something that Paul's prescribing for the church at Corinth. It would be easy to think that this is just for the Corinthians if we did not have the statement at the end of verse 17 which says, and so I direct in all the churches. If you've been th with us uh, in this series in 1 Corinthians, then you know that this particular local church has some very serious issues. 
right? This, by no stretch of the imagination, is the church at Corinth the healthy one. And so it would be easy to conclude, if we did not have this statement, that Paul's simply telling them, remain as you are because you're not able to handle change. You guys are really messed up, you have lots of problems, and you can't handle change. You're not mature enough at this point. You're not doing very well in your current state, so why would you think that circumstantial change is going to help you? That, that would be easy to think that, but that's not the case. Because Paul says that he prescribes this in all the churches, not just the church at Corinth. He tells that to all the churches, whether they're healthy or not. And certainly, if you look at a spectrum of churches in the New Testament, the church at Corinth is on the more broken end of things than some of the other places. But he says this uh, in lots of, uh, he has this concept, he says he directs all the churches in this way. And so this principle of remaining is not just for dysfunctional congregations like the one at Corinth, it's for everyone. He says he directs it in all the churches. So then the question is why? Right? Why is Paul telling everyone in every church that they are to remain as they are? Why are they to remain in their current circumstances? If it has nothing to do with their lack of maturity and health as a church, then what is the purpose? Why is he telling them that? Well, I don't believe that this is the primary reason, but certainly the text does indicate that the sovereignty of God is at least partially in view here. And so verse 17 says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And then in verse 24, he says, Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. In other words, it's no accident that the people that Paul is, is writing to have found themselves in the circumstances that they're in. It's not as if there's just some accidental thing that somehow they ended up in the place that they're in. God was at work and he was bringing out his plans. He was working out his plans in the lives of each, of, each one of them. And so seeking to alter their circumstances neglects the reality that God was up to something when he called them to salvation in the place that they were. God had a purpose for it, and they shouldn't neglect that. But the main reason that Paul is instructing the church and, and churches to remain in their current, current circumstances is this. Circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. In other words, a mere change in circumstances does not gain a person anything with respect to his or her standing with God. It's not valuable in that sense. In fact, if changing our situation, our life circumstances, did somehow gain us uh, or make, make us more acceptable to God, then that would have significant implications with respect to the gospel. In fact, it would undermine the fundamental biblical teaching that God's salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. In other words, the five solas of the Protestant Reformation would be undermined because if changing our circumstances somehow made us more acceptable to God, we would be preaching salvation by works. And so that's clearly not the case. But how do we see this in our passage? Am I just making that up because it sounds spiritual? Well, I hope not. In fact, it is in our text. And so let's, let's look back at this together. Now, I don't want to get too far into the example on circumcision because we're going to talk about that shortly. But I will say this. Paul effectively says in the text that even a religiously motivated change, external change, like circumcision, has no spiritual value. In fact, he says it's nothing. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Well, there's not much lower than nothing, right? He basically says it, it has no value. What matters is obedience keeping the commandments of God because that demonstrates what's going on inside of a person. John chapter 14, verse 15. I'm sure you've heard this at some point before. John chapter 14, verse 15 says this, If you love me, and this is the Lord Jesus speaking, you will keep my commandments. Do you notice the tie between love and obedience? And so the state of one's heart is being demonstrated by obedience to his commands. And so the Apostle Paul is echoing this, basically saying, look, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision, these external things don't matter. What really matters is keeping God's commandments because when that happens, it's demonstrating what's going on in here. Life transformation. And so that's what matters. Not these external things, 
And even an unquestionably negative life situation, like the second example that we'll get to in our text today, like being a slave does not affect a person's standing with God. Uh, I'll say this when I get to the part on slavery. The Apostle Paul certainly is not endorsing the practice of slavery. And in fact, he acknowledges that if someone has the option of being free, that they should obtain their freedom. Uh, he, he, he recognizes that there are obvious practical benefits to being free. But with respect to spiritual implications, slaves and free people have equal standing before God. Their, their status as a slave or as a free person doesn't matter in that sense. Every slave and every free person is a sinner who is justly condemned for their sin under the wrath of God, under judgment, in desperate need of a Savior. They're the same. Doesn't matter if they're slave and free from that or free from that perspective. And so merely obtaining one's freedom in this world does not make a person right with God. And it doesn't win a person uh, somehow additional favor before God. Now, I'll talk about that more when we get to that, that issue, maybe to clarify a bit. But the fact of the matter is we've already seen this principle. We've already seen that believers are called to remain in their current circumstances because circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. We've seen this earlier in chapter 7. And so some within the, the Corinthian church were apparently advocating abstinence within marriage. Or even going so far as to divorce their spouses in order to avoid having a sexual relationship. And so these immature believers who have been influenced by the, the culture around them assume that somehow it was spiritually superior to pursue abstinence at all costs, even in the context that God had created uh, for sexual activity, and so that, that being marriage. And so they assume that it was spiritually superior to pursue abstinence at all costs, and so they, they were pursuing circumstantial change in order to gain supposed spiritual benefits. But in reality, what they were doing, and what po Paul points out, is that they were setting themselves up for sexual temptation. And we saw in chapter 6 very clearly, and I won't be so forceful as I was when I preached on that, that we are to flee sexual immorality. Right? Drop everything and run. Flee. Get out of there. If there's something that Christians should run from, it's certainly sexual immorality. And so it's a bit ironic if you think about it. They thought that they were going to be more spiritual by pursuing abstinence even to the, the point of leaving their spouse so that they could pursue a life of abstinence. But in reality, they're placing themselves in a spiritually dangerous situation because sin is now crouching at their door. And sexual temptation is just around the corner because they've, they've disobeyed the Lord and they're giving up on the, the one avenue that God has given them uh, for sex. And so sin's crouching at their door. They, they think that circumstantial change is going to help them, but actually they've set themselves up for harm spiritually. Now there's a lot more that we could say. We need to move on. But the thrust here, again, is that believers are called to remain in their current circumstances because circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. Now there's a broad range of application here. There, there's no question and we'll see in just a moment, again, Paul provides two examples in the passage, and we've also seen it applied with respect to marriage. But at this point, let me simply say that those of us who are always looking for greener grass need to recognize that while better circumstances may be beneficial in this life, those changes won't change anything with respect to our standing with God. In fact, as the Corinthians found out, those changes could actually set us up for more problems spiritually. And so Paul warns these Corinthians who desired abstinence, watch out, what you're doing is dangerous, and you're going to actually fall into to grave sin because you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing here. And so let's confront this head on before we move on to the examples if you're not being faithful to Jesus in your current circumstances, then what makes you think that it will be any different if you have a different job, a different spouse, a different address? Luke chapter 16, verse 10, the Lord Jesus deals with this. The, the, the reference there is to money, uh, but it certainly has a broader application than this. He who is faithful in a very little thing 
is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. If we are not being faithful to Jesus in our current circumstances, then why would anything be different when our situation is different? Right? If we're not being faithful now, what makes us think that if we just have that one thing, then I'll be more faithful? Am I the only one? I feel like I'm preaching in a library this morning. I feel like I'm in a library. I know that I'm not the only person that thinks that sometimes the grass is greener. I know that I'm not that unspiritual compared to everybody. We all deal with this, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. We all deal with this. We look at circumstances and say, if this was different, I would be more faithful to Jesus. If just this one thing was different, we all do that. Some of us more than others. Maybe I'm the chief of sinners in this. But we look at our circumstances and say, oh, if I just do this, this would be different. But the scripture is saying, what about now? What about right now where God has you? Are you being faithful to Jesus now? Are you being faithful in that place that you don't want to be? Or are you just saying, well, if only this would happen. And Paul says, no, remain. Remain in that condition. Don't try to do this to get some spiritual bang for your buck. Be faithful now and let God deal with those things. Now, again, I'm not saying, and I don't think Paul's saying here, and I'll deal with this more in just a moment, that there's no practical benefits to making certain changes in our lives. The text isn't saying that. I'm not saying. In fact, Melinda and I were were just talking about the other day how much we prefer being here versus when we're in Arizona for multiple reasons. We are thankful to be in Madison with you guys here at Rikers Ridge. That's a personal preference perhaps, but certainly there is a preference there. And, And you may be in a difficult job. You may have difficult children. You may have a difficult spouse. Or some other undesirable living conditions. And I'm not trying to minimize how unpleasant those things can be. We do live in a post-Genesis 3 world. I say that all the time. You may actually have very undesirable life circumstances. I get it. But don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you change this or that, that somehow your spiritual life is going to take off. You're fooling yourself. Remain as you are and be faithful in the life circumstances that you are in right now. And so, there's again, lots of ways that we could apply this. For example, young moms. You might wonder, how in the world can I ever spend any time in the scriptures? My husband and my children are demanding all of my time and and energies, all of my... uh, everything that I have, my attention. And so if I have a spare moment, I don't feel like doing anything. I'm sure if you're a young mom, you can relate to that. I I, I know that. I see that. And so you certainly don't have the time and energy required for serious Bible study. It would seem that way sometimes. And my counsel to you is to be faithful where you are. Be faithful. where I'm not a young mom, but I see a young mom all the time. And, And it's hard. It's a challenge. Kids do things and your husbands do things and all this. Be faithful where you are and stop longing for change. God knows and understands the limitations of our situations. Right? He knows where we're at. He understands that. Be faithful where you are. Consider how you can do certain things for the Lord rather than thinking about what you can't do. Right? We spend so much time thinking, oh, if I could just do this, if I could just do this. What can you do? How can you be faithful to the Lord? Or you may be well past your physical prime, such that it takes everything within you to show up on Sunday morning. You you lament that you can't be as involved in the church as you once were. You, You long for the good old days. But here again, Paul says, remain in the place you are, where you are. Now, obviously, it's not the same situation that you were called to uh, salvation in, as he says in the text, but it's not your fault that you're aging. And in a grand sense, it's our fault because of Genesis 3. But in general, it's, it's not your fault that you're aging. This is the natural course of things in this broken, fallen world. And so the, the, the challenge then is to be faithful to the Lord and to finish strong to our elderly folks. And now that can take a lot of different forms, but the, lo- the Lord knows how you're using your remaining time and energies. The Lord knows that. He sees that. 
Maybe you can't do some of the things that you used to do, but can you devote yourself to prayer? Can you encourage younger believers? Can you seek the good of Christ's church even if it is difficult for you to assemble with the church at times and seasons? And so there's so many different ways that this applies in every station in life. Remain as you are, be content, and be faithful in the circumstances in which you are in. Now let's move on to the examples that Paul has given us in the text. Example number one is this, external changes lack spiritual value. External changes lack spiritual value. We see that application in verses 18 and 19 in our text. Paul mentions circumcision. He says, Corinthians, remain as you are. If you're uncircumcised, stay uncircumcised. If you're circumcised, stay circumcised. Because changing yourself physically to be the opposite way would have no spiritual value. And what matters is genuine obedience to the Lord, as I said a moment ago, because that demonstrates what's going on in a person's heart. Now, now Paul's use of this, this example of circumcision may raise a lot of questions for you, especially if you're not that familiar with the Old Testament. And so let's, let me try to articulate some questions you might have and, and try to answer them. So first, what is circumcision and why is it significant, biblically speaking? Why would he bring up this issue of circumcision? Well, circumcision or the removal of a man's foreskin was practiced by Abraham and his descendants, especially the Israelites, in the Bible. Abraham didn't invent this practice. He didn't make it up. He didn't just one day decide, hey, I think I'll do that. No, th this is something that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and commanded him to be circumcised and to have his descendants after him circumcised. Genesis chapter 17, we see this. Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants... A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so for those who were descended from Abraham... According to the flesh and anyone in their household, circumcision at that point was a matter of obedience. To forego circumcision meant a violation of God's covenant with Abraham. This was serious stuff. You would be cut off. That's serious. But ultimately, circumcision was always supposed to point to a greater spiritual reality. And that is the circumcision of our hearts. And so we see this in another place in Romans chapter 2. Verses 25 to 29, the Apostle Paul deals with this in his letter to the Romans. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, which we all are, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you? who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, not by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. And so again, there's circumcision in a nutshell. There's more we could say, but that's at least an introduction. So then an awkward question, can a person actually go from being circumcised to uncircumcised? He mentions that in the text. He says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to, be, to become uncircumcised. Now technically, no, but apparently there was some sort of surgical procedure developed in the ancient world uh, that would make a person appear as if they'd never been circumcised. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Because every time I think about it, it makes me queasy. So we're not going there. 
But then the question that, that comes from that is, why would a man even want to change himself from one circumcision status to another as an adult? Well, the, the reasons differ depending on which direction someone was going to go. And so if someone was trying to reverse his circumcision, as I just mentioned, in order to appear uncircumcised, he was likely doing it for reasons of social status. In general terms, Gentiles in the ancient world despised circumcision. And so those who would want to distance themselves from their Jewish roots in order to fit in with their Gentile friends and acquaintances might attempt to make an external change in this way. Now that sounds really odd to us in our age of privacy, right? I mean, it just sounds bizarre. But in the first century, there were multiple contexts in which people would have seen one another without clothing. And so notably baths and gymnasiums where people would exercise without the burden of clothing I find it personally difficult to relate to that, uh, but hey, that's how it was, and so they, they didn't ask me. That's how things were in that day and age. However, if an uncircumcised person was considering being circumcised, it was likely for religious reasons, in order to embrace Jewish practices. And so Paul took on this issue quite forcefully in the book of Galatians. We won't go there right now. Galatians chapter 5 he says some things that will make you blush. He deals with it quite forcefully. When people who had come to faith in Christ sought circumcision for religious reasons, they were basically undermining the gospel of grace. They were attempting to do some sort of religious work, and so Paul felt like for the Galatians that he needed to deal with that, that topic head on. So then why does he only deal with that for two verses here in the letter to the Corinthians when it's a major topic in Galatians, in Romans, in other places? Well, as commentators have pointed out, circumcision must not have been that big of an issue in Corinth. He's just using it as an example of a principle. Remain as you are. Don't make a change. If you're this, stay that. If you're that, stay that. Why? Because it doesn't matter. It's nothing. It's just external changes. It doesn't change things inside. What matters is are you obeying the Lord? Because what that reveals is what's going on here. That's important. The, the other stuff, eh, doesn't, it's not really that important. So don't make a big deal out of that. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. In the new covenant, it doesn't really matter. What matters is obedience to the Lord. What matters is living a transformed life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what matters. Not, not the external changes. Now, I'm not sure that this particular change of circumcision and uncircumcision is very tempting for folks now. But even if it is, it doesn't really matter. Because spiritually speaking, what Paul is saying is it's nothing. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But what other external changes are you thinking of making for some supposed spiritual benefit? External religiosity doing things to improve your social status, apart from genuine devotion to Jesus, those things mean nothing. Things that changes that we would make on the outside without genuine devotion to Christ, those things are nothing. Because we're not fooling God. We may be able to fool other people with our external changes, but we can't fool God. He sees it all. Everything is laid bare before him. And so he sees those things. He sees what's going on inside of us. Now we need to move on in order to finish today, but there, there's a second example in our passage. We see it in verses 21 to 23. And that second example is this. Changes in worldly status lack spiritual value. Changes in worldly status lack spiritual value. Now as I said before, the Apostle Paul is by no means endorsing the practice of slavery. And he's not trying to make light of it as if it doesn't matter at all. He's simply recognizing that slavery was a part of the world around him. In the first century world, in the Roman Empire, slavery was practiced. Maybe it's different in some ways than what it's practiced now or has been historically in other times and ages. But he's recognizing that this is a genuine situation that's going on. I've dealt with this before, so I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, other than to say that this is one of the reasons why, in my opinion, the Bible is such an amazing book. Because God's not only talking about the way things should be, He's also dealing with how things are now. This world is not the way it's supposed to be. And so, how should we deal with those things now? In other words, 
The Bible is an intensely practical book. Yes, in a perfect world, slavery would not exist. But what are you supposed to do if you're a slave who's come to faith in Christ? You're in the first century, you're a slave, you come to faith in Jesus, and your question is, what am I supposed to do now? And Paul answers that. What are you supposed to do? How should you live if you have no control of your circumstances? Well, in verse 21, Paul definitely says that it's better to be free if you can. If you are able also to become free, rather do that. But when, and when he says that, that should be obvious to us. When he says that, that, that's an important clarification to our overall principle. That believers are called to remain in their circum, current circumstances because circumstantial change lacks spiritual value. That clarification then is this. It's not wrong or sinful somehow to make changes to our worldly circumstances. Provided, of course, that those circumstances aren't sinful. And many times they are. Obviously, it's wrong for us to walk into a sinful situation and sin. That's obviously wrong. But changing our worldly circumstances alone, that doesn't mean that somehow we're rebelling against God if we're not remaining as you are. That's a misunderstanding of what he's saying. But what he is saying is that you are mistaken if you think that making these changes is somehow going to magically make your spiritual life take off. If somehow that's going to improve your status with your creator. And so, in other words, what Paul has been saying is, it's not more spiritual to be married or to be single. Each one has practical benefits, right? Those of you who are married should understand that for sure. There's practical benefits to being single. I see those more now that I'm married. I see what those benefits are, and you probably do too. But there's also practical benefits to being married. And so, again, it's not more spiritual to be one or the other. Same thing for slaves and free people. Obviously, it's better to be free. But being free in this world doesn't mean that you're right with God. Right? We live in a country where we have all kinds of freedoms. But does that mean that everybody in our nation is right with God? Of course not. And so the status there doesn't matter in that sense. Being a slave in this life doesn't mean that a person's somehow being punished by God for, the, for their life. That's, that doesn't indicate that. In fact, in, ver, in verse 22, the Apostle Paul says there's aspects in which believing slaves are free because they've been set free from the penalty of their sin. That is the wrath of God. So, yeah, maybe they're a slave in this life, but they're free because they're no longer bound by their sin in the way that they were. And then there's another sense in which believers who are free are actually slaves of Christ. In other words, they've been bought with a price. They belong to him. And if you're in Christ, that's the case for all of us. Right? You're not your own. Remember he said that earlier? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Paul calls himself a bond slave. Wait a minute. Paul wasn't a slave or a servant, but he was to Jesus. And so are we if we're in Christ. And so there's an aspect here where slaves are free and free are slaves. And Paul's saying, look, the status in this life, in, in, a, in the eternal perspective, is not that important. Because changing that circumstance, while you may gain practical benefits in this life, that's not going to change your status with the Lord. What you need is a Savior. What you need is someone to rescue you from your own sin and the wreckage that it's caused... And the fact that you have to face a holy and righteous God on your own, that's a perilous situation. And so you need a redeemer. And that redeemer is Jesus Christ. And so, uh, again, uh, the, the, this, this issue of freedom and slavery in verse 23, Paul adds this. He does recognize that freedom grants us uh, some, some benefits because we, if we have freedom, we can use our lives for the Lord. And so, in verse 23, it says, you were bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. In other words, don't give up the freedom that you have, which you can actually use for the Lord. That is a benefit, but it's not going to provide any benefits to you spiritually in the sense of your status with God. It doesn't change anything there. And so the conclusion that we have to reach today is this. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to serve God in our current, our present circumstances and stop focusing on changing this and changing that outward things for the supposed spiritual benefits that those things will provide. Even very important changes in this life will yield nothing spiritually. They lack ultimate spiritual value. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. 
I'm not preaching or I'm not speaking against living a disciplined life for Jesus. Definitely not saying that. And also, I'm not preaching easy believism where it doesn't matter how you live. That's not what we're saying here. That's not what Paul's saying. Far from it. But what I am saying is that if the externals change and nothing on the inside changes, then the external changes have no spiritual benefit. Period. What does he say? What matters is keeping God's commandments because that reveals what's going on inside. Chew on that. It is better to obey than to sacrifice as King Saul found out in 1 Samuel 15 when God said, wipe out the Amalekites. And he said, well, I think I have a better idea. I think I'll save these things for sacrifice, right? And uh, the the prophet Samuel says, no, God's going to actually take your kingdom away from you. And then he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Internal changes. How does that happen? Here's where we intersect with the gospel. What does Jesus say in John 3? You must be born again. How does this happen? How does the internal change take place? Is it just somehow we grit our teeth and magically we're just transformed? Or did someone have to do a work in us to transform us, to change us from the inside out. Yes, that's why Jesus says you must be born again. How does that happen? Repentance, turning away from the old life, leaving sin behind, and looking to Christ in faith, the only one who can save us. The only one who lived the life that God expected, the only one who met God's righteous requirements, lived a perfect life, was not under God's wrath because of anything he had done, and yet subjected himself to it when he died on a Roman cross in order to take our place. You must be born again. And so when you, when you repent, when God calls you to salvation, and he changes you from the inside out, there is genuine life transformation that takes place. When you respond in faith to Jesus He's calling you. He calls you out of your old life. And there is genuine transformation that occurs. You must be born again. And so the question for you today is, are you born again? Have you yielded your life to the only one who can save you? The only one who can deliver you from God's coming wrath? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one who died for sinners and the one who was raised again and is able to give new life to you today. If that's you this morning and you've not come to Jesus Christ in faith, would love to talk and pray with you about that. If you're looking for a church home, you're considering becoming a member of Rikers Ridge, uh, we've finished one new members class or two, actually two rounds. We can go again whenever. Love to talk and pray with you about that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we acknowledge that we are many times a a discontented people. We look to change things in this life thinking that somehow that's going to be the one thing that will change everything. And we neglect to be faithful in the circumstances that we're in, that you have sovereignly placed us in. God, forgive us for our waywardness. Forgive us for our lack of trust. Forgive us for trying to take the wheel from you so many times. Our lack of faithfulness. God, we pray. We, we recognize that these are things that, that must be changed by you. That, that our natural bent, our natural inclination is toward faithlessness. But you, O oh God, are able to transform us. And so we pray that you would, by your spirit, that we would be content and faithful regardless of where we find ourselves. And certainly we're here now in this place, in this time, whether we like it or not, Lord, help us to be faithful, to remain as we are, that you might be glorified in us and through us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.